Gabe. Look at you. Here he is. <laughs> All the trees here. Thank you. opportunities for you to get dressed up in one day. Right. Right. Stay awake at night. <laughs> Worrying about that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Please kick it off. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. You're welcome. What are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about TIFs. Tax increment financing, sometimes they're referred to as TIDs, which, it, which is a tax increment district, but either one means the same. What's in a TIF? Got it? Good name. It's a mechanism used for funding development and redevelopment projects within a city. <coughs> it allows the taxing jurisdiction benefiting from the development to share in its cost. Cities and villages may create a TIF if 50% or more of the proposed district or area is blighted. And there's a maximum life in a TIF for a blighted uh, area of 27 years. Is in need of rehabilitation or conservation work. That's also 27 years. Is suitable for industrial sites, which has a 20-year life, or is suitable for mixed-use development, which also has a 20-year life. How does a TIF work? Upon creation, the value of a TID is frozen for property tax purposes. So, for example, if we draw boundaries around some property and say that's going to be a new TIF, whatever the value of those properties are at the time is frozen, and that's called the base of the TID. That base still shares the taxes that are collected to all the taxing jurisdictions. The difference in the TID is that when we have new development, any increment of development that's over and above that base, the city gets to retain the full tax rate in order to pay back for any of the mechanisms it's used to finance that, whether it's borrowing debt or on a pay-as-you-go basis to a developer to incent the developer to put uh, a new project on that property. Hey, Jim, could you give us an example? I mean, like, how did Blue Harbor work in that respect? Well, that whole peninsula was a TID. So when, when Blue Harbor came in, the city put all the infrastructure in, the water, the sewers, the roads, the parking, and it incurred about $16 million of debt. And based on that, when people developed down there, say, for example, Blue Harbor, um, all of the taxes was an increment to the base. The city, I think, put in $16 million for development. It paid $13 million for the land, Nancy, or something like that. So that was the base of the TID. So anything that went on the ground after that, because uh, there was nothing developed there, was an increment to that TID. So the, the infrastructure that the city put in was not part of the increment? Correct. Okay. Once a TIF closes, all the taxing entities go back and then get the 
what was the increment that the city collected then gets distributed to all the taxing entities. So at the end of that, they get the benefit of the development. But again, it's 20 to 27 years out. So do we save up for that? Or <laughs> how does that work? I'm sorry? Do we save up for that, knowing that in 27 years we're going to have to pay a fair amount of money to a number of taxing entities? Well, we, don't know we, we, kind of we make enough money on the increment to pay back the debt we incurred to spur that development. Okay. So once that's accomplished, and again, I'll go, I'll go through the TIDs and show you that, uh, then it all goes back to all the taxing authorities, and we get our 35%, which is <clears throat> roughly the city's rate of the total tax rate. On an ongoing basis. On a, yes, Got it. on an ongoing yes. basis. How do we fund these TIF projects? Um, we can bond for them, like we did uh, at South Pier. The city borrowed roughly $16 million to do the infrastructure. It could be a city lead pay-as-you-go. Uh, in that instance, it's really where there are some grant monies that the city can get a hold of and give the developer the benefit of it. Uh, but we use the last one, uh, which is a developer lead pay-as-you-go, where a developer comes in and, and based on the increment he's going to put in, we pay him so much back over a period of time. And the advantage of that is so the city doesn't have to go out and borrow money in order to pay the developer. We pay it as he uh, develops the property, and if he puts the proper increment in, he gets what we have promised to him. If the increment is short of what was projected, the developer only gets what he actually put in as an increment. TIDs we have in Sheboygan are TID 5, which is Paper Box, TID 6, South Pier, TID 7 is Nemshoff, the plant, TID 10 is Water Street Development, 11 is Washington Square, Square. 12 is 8th Street Office Building, 13 is Landmark Condos, 14 is Festival Foods, 15 is Pick and Save, and TID E1, which is an environmental TID, is uh, Northgate Property. What I laid out here, and you can see, uh, I got copies in your folder. We plotted from 2006 through 2013. The bottom blue line is the base of the TID. So when the TID was formed, and this is a small TID, but when this TID was formed, there's roughly a million dollars of value in that TID. You can see the increment, and if you look over to the far right, the increments in thousands. It started out in 06 with 54,000. It grew to 144, and currently today, the increment is at 121,000. <clears> now, you have to understand that these TIDs are, for the manufacturing piece in these TIDs, the state puts values on them, and they put the value on the entire TID. So, we get from the state, not for individual parcels within that TID, but we get a value for the entire TID, which shows the base and then the increment in that TID. And the state does that based on market value, if you will. Um, they call it equalized value, but that's supposed to represent market, so that every year these fluctuate. Uh, they use our assessment ratio um, and then take other factors uh, that they use to determine market to put a value on the four walls of a TID, if you will. So as these things fluctuate, the city's revenue fluctuates in these TIDs as well. A good example is the next one, which is TID 6. TID 6 had a base value of $20 million. And you can see that on the right side that in 2009 it hit its peak. The increment was $112 million. And as you go down to 2013, you can see the increment is now only $35,000. There were several factors that affected this. One was the sale of Blue Harbor. Uh, when the city negotiated Blue Harbor, they had um, some um, contracts in place where if the estimated value of the property fell below a certain value, Blue Harbor had to make it up on the real estate tax side. And it also had um, a contract where if it did not generate enough of room tax revenue for the convention center, which the city built and owns, it made that delta up as well. 
when Blue Harbor was sold, those, both those deals went away. Uh, so we lost a fair amount of increment. Uh, when you look at uh, Blue Harbor was built for $40 million and sold for four, we lost $36 million of increment uh, the day it was sold. Um, the condos that uh, were attached to Blue Harbor were valued at roughly $20 million. And based on where market ended up um, several years ago, uh, it's currently at $10 million. So we lost about $10 million of revenue there as well. And the condos, what's the name of the condos across the river, Chad? The new ones? Marina Vista, Marina Vista same thing. Uh, valued at close to $16 million, have a value currently today of under $7 million. So that TID has gone through some downsides based on the economy, <coughs> and it put the TID in jeopardy of meeting its payments. So in 2012, uh, we've got, we had two TIDs that we could amend that had more incremental value in it or cash to fund TID 6 so that we can pay the, the interest and principal on TID 6. Hey, Jim, when you say, since they're televising, we should probably have our little microphone. Um, when you said it was almost in jeopardy of not making its payment, what did you mean by that? Well, based on the increment we collect is the revenue that we use to pay the debt that we incurred. Okay. So it's just a straight line yes. relationship. Okay. Yes. At $106 million, we were making far more increment than our debt payment. But at $35 million, we're falling short by five to six hundred thousand dollars. Jim, I have an old question also. Who establishes the initial, um, what would you call it, the value of the property? You know, you're saying Blue Harbor was initially valued at X amount of dollars. Is that purely just construction costs or is there? Is well, there when, it's, when it's brand new, it's basically on what it costs to build. And the assessor will, after a period of time, look at the revenue approach on commercial property. Uh, so we'll go and value it based on earnings. Uh, the manufacturing piece, this, our assessor does not do, the state does. TID 7, which is Nemshoff, you can see that uh, there was a $3 million base. Uh, we currently have about $5 million of increment, and that TID is in, is in pretty good shape. TID 10, which is Water Street. <coughs> We have maps up here if anybody's <coughs> interested. I, maybe I'm going a little bit too fast. If you want to see the TID and what's in it. You don't, you don't need to talk about the maps. You guys are great. Yeah, talk yeah. About that so you didn't oh, have go ahead. To where this is. Great. Let's go back, so to, let's go back to TID 7. I think TID 6 and 5 are. Yeah. We'll do TID 5. Do TID 5. TID 5, it, for those of you that can see, really encompasses the Shipway newspaper box plant. This is South 7th Street, Claire, right here. Georgia is up here. This is the plant. It was really set up for expansion uh, really. And so any of you existing Sheboygan paper box makes up that entire district. Um, you can kind of see that by the, the boundaries. A little bit of the street is in here. But the majority of TID 5 is Sheboygan paper box. Any questions on that? TID 6 is more than just South Pier. Um, this is South Pier. It also includes uh, the capsule building, the Highland House, Rock Line Industries, um, and then it goes up onto the east side of South A Street, I mean, west side of South A Street, and includes all the properties um, from the old Power and Light Place <coughs> up to the Swing Street with the school district. And then it follows along and it includes, as Jim referenced, Marina Vista condos. It includes Marina Vista and the whole kind of walk lakefront uh, with the marina at the land park and the beach. So it's, it's, and then it also includes the Penn Fair properties to the south of South Pier. So when it says South Pier, it's really more, the district is a lot larger. So when fluctuations happen in values, um, you know, that's where you're seeing it from is based on what the entire district looks like. Chad? Yes. Would the YMCA be in that or is they on the other side of the street? They're they on would. the other side of the street. So okay, they're so they're. In there, yeah, they're not taxable anyway. Right. So TID 7 is the NEM, when we say NEM shop plan, NEM shop shares, it really encompasses the majority of the NEM shop plans. And this is what we call the flex custom municipal building. Um, municipal service building sits up here. This is New Jersey, uh, South 22nd Street, and it goes back to the plant that's along the river. It does
does include some redevelopment parcels, potential redevelopment parcels in the future if Nemshop was ever to expand. I'll put it in blue, set up to help the Nemshop plan through expansion. So it's got the majority in the plan. Wildwood softball park would be right here outside of the district on 6-7. So Chad, we, we would have, like, the improvements that we made would be um, streets and <coughs> lighting and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, there was some with expansion plans. There was some water main with some storm sewers that had gone through there, and they had to be relocated as part of their expansions to expand over. So that's where our incentives had, our help had gone into relocating utility lines and development to expand. Okay, got it. Thanks. If we could back up just for, for a minute. Um, from a TID-5 perspective, um, that currently is the only one that is slightly underwater. Um, that TID was formed in May of 91. The max life is through 2018. Um, and it looks like that when we close this out in 2018, uh, we'll probably have about $2,000 that will be shy on that investment. Not significant, but a couple thousand dollars. TID 6, um, that TID was formed in 1992. It's got an expenditure period for that TID that we could spend money to, re to recoup in debt through 2017. It expires in 2023. Uh, we currently have it extended to 2023. Uh, and with the help of TID 11, which I talked about, uh, and we'll get to in a bit, we're able, because that TID has cash in it, has an increment that's greater than its debt, uh, we'll transfer about $2.4 million uh, to TID 6, and by the end of 22, TID 6 will be home. So that's the good news, even with all of the shortfall in revenue. Could you explain the difference between the, the life, let's say it's a 27-year TIF, versus the expenditure period? Right, there's normally five years between the end of the TID and the expenditure period. Because if you spend money, the theory is, is that you're gonna recoup that investment through the end date of that TID. So they normally end within five years of the end date, the expenditure period. So we could theoretically invest money uh, or borrow money uh, for further development in TID 6 uh, with the hopes that we would get it paid back by the end of 2023. TID 7, um, again, NEMSHA. That was formed in 1994. It ends in 2021. Um, this looks like that we'll probably close it in 2016, ahead of its life, uh, unless they come back with some further development on that site, NEMSHA to expand. Um, all of the debt will be repaid uh, by the end of 2016 so we can close the TID out. There will be, it appears, at least on the projections, the projections that we used in these is looking at the 2012 rate for 13 and the 2013 TID values supplied by the state. We projected those out through the end of the TIDs, not assuming that they would fluctuate, that they would go any lower or any higher other than if we knew that to be a fact if something changed between 12 and 13. So I would look at it as a conservative view of the future, um, but one never knows. Uh, hopefully we're through the trough on values, um, but I know that we'll probably have a couple point differential in 14 as opposed to 13 because our assessment ratio went to 110%. And when we did these estimates, they were at 108%. TID 10, Water Street. Just to talk a little bit about TID 10. Um, this is Pennsylvania Avenue on the south side, uh, South Water Street and North Penn Street. I mean, North Water Street and North Penn Street. Um, this really includes the de redevelopment of what would be called the very fine um, area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it follows the river um, all the way down 
parcel and they've been working to try to get a development on there, um, market rate apartments or some kind of tax generating uh, development. But the rest of the rest of the district is really being sort of part two parks workers, Water Street Park and then this Riverside Park that were included into it. And then it was amended later on to include the Walgreens at the corner of 14th and Erie. So this kind of makes up the whole <coughs> We were a little worried about this, TID as well. It was formed in 97. Uh, it ends in 2024. The city had borrowed a lot of money to reclaim um, the property because of the contamination. It has an outstanding advance to the general fund, Nance, of about $2.5 million as we sit here today. But it appears that by the end of 2023, uh, we'll, it, we will be able to pay the advance back to the general fund, and this TID should be okay as we see it today. To 11, Washington Square. To 11 is, uh, really starts down here, this is Washington Avenue, South Business Drive, and the railroad tracks on the south, on the west side. This is, um, the, this is the parcel that uh, Steve Schmidt has done, pulled some of the construction stuff on it. Then these are the outlines Washington Square development, and that's really what has driven the development of this TIF district was redevelopment of Washington, the development of Washington Square from the former Conoco Hill site, which was a oil refinery. Um, so the, the strip center and then all of the outlot development along here is included in this district. So it, it really goes from uh, north of the south of Lawrence and down along the railroad tracks to the far south side. This TID generates about $300,000 a year more in increment than it does in debt. So we amended this TID to feed TID 6 to help pay that off. And over the life of this TID, it ends in 21 and the payments go through 21. It pays about $2.4 million to help TID 6. Just a question for Chad. Um, Chad, is um, the property to the south of uh, Piggly Wiggly there, um, does the city own that? No, this is a private developer that's okay. going to develop the Washington Square. Is there, are there plans to add on there, or is that just going to be held no, as green they're, space? They're, they're marketing like a developable uh, site, so that will bring additional revenue okay. into it. Um, the, there's a culvers plan that's breaking ground here. To 12, a downtown office building. So TID 12 includes um, the downtown office building and the metal shop chairs from the Miller where they're located on the east side of the uh, above and beyond children's museum. So the children's museum here, um, this is the office building. The, the district used to just include the office building and the parcels across the road This TID, uh, since it started, lost about half of its value. I think the peak in 2009 was about $11 million. It's currently at 5.3. Uh, but having said that, it was formed in 2000. Uh, the max life on this is to 2027. And it appears, based on the increment we have and the debt that needs to be repaid, we'll probably repay this by 2019. Yes. Could Boston store be added to that TIF since it's going to be empty soon? We've talked about that. There's a possibility that we could look at extending or overlaying the TIF if need be. Um, maybe Chad or Jim, you want to explain? We only get so many amendments to TIFs to add things in or take 
things out of, whether it's you know sharing equipment or um, expanding the boundaries. Yeah. So to mend the boundary, mend the project camp. So I have an original project camp for this one. Where the Total of four. Total of four property amendments uh, for boundaries. Um, so there is some opportunity there. Uh, the challenge is, is where, what is the best time to amend it and include the property? Because if you recall, in Jim's previous discussion earlier, we were talking about capturing that new increment. So since Boston Store already has a value as it sits today, does it make sense for that to be in the district now? Or should some Development happens, should it be in the district at that time to capture more increment to allow you to do more things? Those are the things that, as you know, developers, we need to weigh at the city level to see what the best uh, time it is to maximize the amount that we can do uh, to try to redevelop it. So, you know, whether it's a new store or a completely new um, idea there, you know, depending on when, the, you know, we have to look at what the time is right. Is it better to have a clean slate and because the value of the land is better to have the, the land and the building, but then your value is going to be higher, so your increment is going to be less. So we have to weigh all those things as we're looking at this to figure out the direction, but there definitely is some opportunity in this district. You know, and then the other thing is is some of these districts that may close out with a little bit more of a cash value, there may be some interest in expanding them to include some of the streets. Um, in, in the new districts, you'll see we've included the streets um, in case we need to do infrastructure improvements. It would be another way of funding um, some infrastructure improvements versus having fund them all the way all the time through the capital improvements program. Um, so we're looking at that option as well. <coughs> This did was formed in 2005. It runs to 2032. It had no debt against it. We just had a developer incentive that we had pay, we needed to pay. It appears that that'll be paid off through 2019. So if there's nothing else we can do, this TID would end. But it goes on for another 13 years after that and has a, a very good incentive in it. So that's potentially something that in 16 or 17, we, won't, we might want to look at so that we could do something there to uh, further help that area. Did 14, which is Festival Foods.
Under TID 14, uh, that was formed in 2011. It runs through 2031. It appears that uh, the, there was only a developer incentive that was to be paid in that TID, and it appears that that will be paid by 2020 uh, based on the increment we have in there now. So again, this is another mixed-use TID that uh, we've got another 11 years of life in, and around 17 or 18, we should look at that to see if there's anything we want to do with the increment to carry it forward. Bid 15, which is pick and save. As you recall, probably the last council meeting, um, we came to the council to borrow or make an advance from the general fund to TID 15 to pay the incentive agreement. There is no debt in that TID. But the increment that we had, as you can see from the slide up here, in 12, it was only $3.1 million, even though the value that was put in in the increment was roughly $7 million by pick and save. So we lost value in the rest of the TID. So with the revenue we took in, we didn't have enough to pay the incentive agreement. But as you can see, in 13, it's gone to seven. I think it's going to drop a, a couple million dollars below that because of Bethesda. That strip mall was bought by Bethesda, and that's you know a non-taxing entity. So it looks like this TID, based on the latest projections, uh, should be okay in 15 and 16. It ends in 31, and we're projecting it to be paid off, or the the developer's agreement in 2026. So even though we had to borrow some money from the general fund this year to pay the increment, pay the developer's agreement, it looks like in the long haul we'll be okay. And the last one is uh, Northgate. date that was formed, it was 2002, it ends in 25, 2025, and it appears based on the debt we have today and some advances that are open against it, it should close in 2021 and be okay. I think we, we covered this, but it says TID amendments. A TID may be amended for four reasons. To modify the plan, uh, to add or subtract property in that, that TID, to extend the lifespan of the TID, or to donate tax increments to other TIDs. So uh, we've done three of those, I think, in the city with the TIDs that we've had. In TID amendments, Chad covered boundaries may be changed up to four times. No limit on project plan amendments one expenditure period amendment if it's not cash flowing. 
I think these next set of slides I really covered as I went through them. We can re recap them pretty quick. And again, this is for your information. It shows the start date, the expenditure period, the end date of the TID, the maximum life, our estimated closure date based on our forecast. It shows expected revenues, expected expenses in the TID. And I told you in TID 5, we'd be a couple thousand dollars shy. And it shows the valuations that are based on a 2013 equalized increment value of $120,800 and a 2012 tax rate of $23.78. TID 6, a lot bigger number. Um, again, revenues projected are $15,536,000. Uh, expenses are $15,536,000. And again, uh, maybe a little conservative, but we based the value of that TID going forward on a $35 million increment. TID 7, Nemshoff plant. Uh, this shows a revenue of 572. Expenses of 475. So when we end it in that year, there'll be excess revenue in that TID, and that'll be like TID three when we closed out last year. All the taxing entities will get their piece of the revenue over expenses when that TID closes out. So in this example, we would share roughly $100,000. Uh, we'd get roughly 35, and the other taxing entities would get the balance once it's closed. Water Street. Again, closing that in 23 with an end date of 24. Um, we break even on this one with uh, roughly $2.8 million of revenue and expense. Jim, how do you calculate the um, administrative fees? Is there a formula or? They're normally set if we do put them in. There's some in here that we pay an administrative fee to the state. There's other TIDs that we put in an administrative fee for the city to administer the program, such as these last two in developer agreements. I think it's like $7,500 a year that we put in for the administration of it. Oh, is that right? There's an expense okay. related to that, so. Washington Square, Tid, um, that will end in 21. Uh, as you can see, there's $4 million of revenue and $3.3 .3 million of expenses. So it says there'll be roughly $700,000 that we would share if we found no other use for that TID. 8th Street Office Building, TID 12. Again, we've got uh, a little more revenue than expense there, so we would be sharing uh, roughly $200,000 if we closed it in 19. Uh, the TID goes out to 27 unless we find another use. Landmark condos, TID 13, um, 1.7 in revenues. When we expect to close it out in 19, there'll be a million five of expense, so there'll be a couple hundred thousand. Again, we'd share if we found no other purpose. And again, this is closing out roughly 13 years early. So there's definitely something that uh, the city could look at doing there and extending the boundaries. Festival Foods, TID 14. Again, there'll be some cash left over as we project it, roughly for almost $500,000. And that will close out 11 years early as well. So again, there's some opportunity for the city in the future. TID 15, pick and save. Again, about $300,000 and probably five years of life left. Um, so there's other possibilities that we could look at in that TID as well. And Northgate, TID E1. Um, again, um, thank God it's breaking even. Uh, that one's been a stretch, uh, but we're closing it about four years early. Advantages of TIDs. Increases property values. It spurs private investment and development, uh, which is what we all seek in the city to create that value on the revenue side uh, so that we can keep our our cost structure in line. Incremental revenues reinvested in the TID district. That also helps um, to stir more economic development and the benefits the underlying tax bodies at the end of the TID life. It not only benefits the city to pay back the money it's borrowed to do the development, but it also helps the other taxing entities 
with that increment once the TID is dissolved. Some of the disadvantages is if the increment does not materialize as planned, the city must find other sources of funds to cover the expenses, and that was an example that I used that we had in TID 15 uh, just a couple weeks ago. Underlying tax districts see no benefit until the TID is really terminated, which is 20 to 27 years out. TIDs may be used in areas where development would have occurred anyway. Again, it's the chicken or the egg. And increases the administrative burden on managing a local authority to manage these TIDs and the properties within them. Any questions? Of course. city has what's called a joint review board um, and that is made up of all of the taxing jurisdictions so the, the uh, LTC the school district the county and the city and they all come together when we're proposing to do a TIF or a change the boundaries or add a project in there they have to approve it because it's really their tax dollars that they're in essence losing out on um, so there is a process and procedure in place they have to agree agree on that um, you know, take a vote in that type of stuff to make sure that they're on board. You just can't go out and say, I'm going to set up a TIF here and not talk to the other underlying taxing jurisdictions. And is, is that a unanimous vote or? I mean, no, do they you, could vote again. They could. I mean, do you need the approval of each and every taxing? Yes. And, okay. They have, a, they, have a vote on the, they have a vote on that committee, isn't that correct, Steve? Yeah, yeah. it's a majority vote. But it's a majority vote. Uh, yeah. One other... Uh, issue with respect to this sort of big picture issue is uh, historically cities and villages incorporated municipalities have the power to create TIFs and that's because your the process is development of of uh, communities incorporated areas uh, towns do not have TIF authority although over the last few years they've been pushing like crazy in the legislature to try to get Authority to create TIFs, and you know the issue is, for instance, uh, and one TIF that was not discussed here because it was already paid off is the industrial park. If uh, uh, that was very successful TIF used to uh, generate revenue to create the industrial park in the city, if towns are allowed to create TIFs, they're given that authority. We're going to be in a very difficult competitive disadvantage because uh, uh, typically you're looking at more rural areas. The towns are going to be able to develop uh, things like industrial parks if they have the TIF ability uh, uh, in competition with cities and villages. So uh, I know it hasn't happened yet, but I, I see that there's some proposal to grant the town of Brookfield or something like that specific authority to create a TIF for a specific purpose. I don't think it's passed yet, but uh, it's, it's being discussed and the towns year after year in the legislature are pushing for authority to create TIFs. And if, if that happens, it will have a great uh, dis, uh, disincentive to the cities. Right now, a developer comes in, wants to uh, do a project. The uh, city can offer the availability of financing to the TIF district. The town cannot. So uh, if the towns can offer TIF financing, it's going to be a lot tougher to develop in the cities. The latest proposal in Madison that's on the floor right now is that towns and villages greater than 5,000 people would have the ability to to TIF, um, which again, I don't know the population of all the municipalities or towns and villages around us, but could be a challenge. There have been proposals over the years, over the last about 15 years. The League of Wisconsin Municipalities has historically been very strongly opposed to uh, the ability of towns to have TIFs, and uh, it's really a, a competitive issue. And, and if towns can create I think that the important point in all of this is that those TIFs that were created over time 
appear to be okay and will end successfully and that we didn't have to use taxpayers' dollars vis-a-vis -vis borrow more money to throw at these to pay back the debt. So that's the good news in all of this. And some of them appear to be very successful as well. And in the spirit of the TID have developed the incentive or the development that benefits not only the city but all the taxing entities. Is there a limit on the number of uh, districts that we can have in the city? Okay. Is any of the tax dollar that goes, uh, it's uh, basically the, in the TIF, the money goes back to pay all everything, all the expenses. Does any of that money go towards public protection and safety? Any fire, police, street maintenance? Nothing at all. So then the burden for the rest of the community is to make sure that we, can, we have enough money to supply uh, them with fire protection, police protection. Well, don't forget, we charge them a rate, and they get the full city rate they pay <coughs> in taxes, but we use that to pay the debt. But that goes back to the debt. Okay. And that's only the increment. You know, we still get up to, you know, 35% of up to the base. Mm -hmm. right. And then the, that increment we get as well to pay back that. So we're still getting, you know, something for general operations and that underlying base. Okay. Are there protections for the city built in? I don't suppose they could over such a long period of time, but in the developer lead pay as you go, the develop, uh, development agreements, where the developer would indemnify the city for losses or probably can't do that, huh? Yeah, okay. The only disincentive for a developer is, is if he does a development and says, I'm going to add an increment of X, and he comes short of X, he only gets paid on what he actually put in, okay. not on the agreement. Do you foresee any new TIDs coming up? Real close. There might be some wiggling of boundaries, you know, based on some of the things that were brought up, but not as of today. Anything else? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jim.